Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to talk at Nudge Talk today. So um, today I'm going to talk about a topic which is something which I'm very uh, passionate about, and this is about safe space for sustainability. Okay, so a little bit introduction about myself uh, beforehand. Um, so I'm a behavior design and strategic communication specialist out of uh, based in Indonesia, and uh, my background is actually in environment and sustainability issues. But in the past seven years, I have taken a little bit of uh, uh, the cr creative side of things in order to uh, uncover insight-led solutions and finding creative interventions for sustainability. And in practice, I've worked with various NGOs, development partners, also corporations to help them in solving uh, various sustainability issues. And I usually use approach of human-centered design. And I'm also using a bit of insights from behavior science and behavior economics in order to design the intervention. Um, so I've been very lucky to work on various uh, sustainability issues from peatland, um, waste management, climate change, and so on. And today, I would like to share with you uh, some of the lessons learned from those insights and in working with these various issues. So first of all, I really believe that there's still a lot of potential for behavior insight to advance sustainability in many environmental policies and programs. And um, particularly for a developing country context, I think uh, this uh, opportunity has not yet been leveraged enough and we need to work out more about how we can influence the uh, sustainability practitioners in order to take into account behavior insights into their work. And today, uh, I'm going to tell you how I apply that in the context of the country that I live in and, and the country that I'm operating. So um, Indonesia is the largest South, uh, economy in Southeast Asia. It has more than 200 ethnic groups a population of uh, 270 million, poverty rate of around 13.2%, but still a bit of disparity and a Gini ratio of 0 0.385. And I wanted to show you why this is important. So I'm going to go to show you a map of Indonesia. So you can see this is a really huge uh, country with more than 17,000 islands, and uh, we're basically an archipelago. But Unfortunately, uh, most of the uh, intervention designers are located in this particular area here, which is the island of Java, where the capital city of Jakarta is also located. And uh, what this means is that there's a lot of knowledge that is being centered in that area. Uh, and this really affects the way we designed inter intervention for sustainability. And so, I came up with a bit of a hypothesis, and this hypothesis is that intervention for sustainability, particularly in the context of a developing country, it can fail um, because we have a bias as intervention designers. So to illustrate a little bit of uh, why I come up with this hypothesis, I'm going to show you two uh, case studies that I worked on uh, for an, uh, an environmental issue. And the first one, is um, a, key pay, a case study on peatland. So um, for, uh, peatland is extremely important in Indonesia. Um, peatland is an area of soil that holds a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and it's also home to a lot of very important biodiversity and species such as the orangutan. But unfortunately, it's also uh, uh, often being burned uh, into the conversion of agriculture. So um, this has caused one of the worst fire in Indonesia in 2015. And so in order to avoid that in the future, it's very important for us to have a better monitoring and reporting system of, uh, fi for fire pre prevention. So in this context, uh, we work together, uh, my team and I, uh, we work together with uh, an NGO in Indonesia and we wanted to develop an app uh, with the hope that this app can uh, provide obtain better user generated content from around peatland uh, from around peatland area so from from people living around the peatland area so hopefully they can report whenever they see any fire or anything uh, related to peatland situation 
Uh, and it sounds like a good idea, uh, I'm sure, uh, at the beginning. But then uh, we wanted to challenge our assumptions. So we uh, set out to do a study or research uh, in the area where most of the peatland uh, are located. So as you can see here, this is uh, where we are or where most of the intervention designers are located. And we uh, went to this area in the, in, the, in, in the island of Sumatra. And to get there, well, we had to take a two hour plane uh, flight and then uh, another uh, three hours car ride and then another one hour boat ride. So um, just to illust illustrate a little bit of the disparity of uh, the situation from people coming from an urban area and people then living in, uh, in the rural area. So um, uh, what did we learn from, from this case study? So it was interesting because we realized that our intervention could fail <laughs> uh, by using that app. And this was particularly because of four reasons. The first one being that, um, so the, the, the phone, phone signals were basically unstable there. So it was generally difficult to rely on your phone for reporting. And also we created a mock-up of the app and found that, that it was difficult for our users to navigate through. So it was not necessarily because of the UI UX, but also because the, our intervention subjects were not uh, very tech savvy. And the third one is um, we use a lot of peatland terminologies in that app. And um, although our intervention subject, they knew how uh, peatland looked like, a lot of them were confused by the terminologies that we had introduced. And so um, they, they couldn't really understand what, uh, what those mean. And uh, the last one is, although many were, were aware about the impact uh, of peatland fire on their life, it was uh, environmental stewardship was basically not one of the one of the reasons or uh, for them to change behavior. So uh, what did we learn is that our initial assumption might have been totally wrong and uh, that we had to think about different intervention strategies to achieve the same objective behavior that we want, which is we wanted to get um, real-time collection of data from stakeholders around peatland areas. So just a little, to add a little bit of a, another insights, um, I'm going to illustrate uh, another case study from the fishery sector. So uh, the fishery sector is also very important in Indonesia. It contributes to um, more than 7 million jobs. And um, as you can see, we're an archipelago. So it's a, the fishermen are basically a very important um, uh, livelihood that helps us to provide for, for proteins. Um, so in this uh, case study, we, uh, we were working together with another environmental NGOs to find out narratives on how we could increase awareness and understanding about um, sustainable fisheries. And so we did the same. We went to three different harbor areas in Indonesia, which was very far away from where the intervention designers were located. So it was a very unfamiliar context uh, with us. Um, and this is... Uh, how it looks like. And what was interesting to see is we learned um, about two things. So first is that fishermen, even though they realized that in the past decade, they, their uh, fish catch was uh, reducing, but they don't necessarily think that fish is going to run out in the future. Um, and that was very interesting to see because um, they also said that um, the reason they didn't believe that happened was because uh, they feel that it was just fate um, if uh, fish is going to be, you know, one day they have a good catch and the next day they haven't. And another very interesting insights from that study uh, or from that research was that we learned that a lot of fishermen, or there was a, like, a, like a pattern of fishermen who mentioned that they would be interested to, to uh, do uh, more sustainable fishing behavior or to conduct that behavior for the reason of nationalism, of uh, because they wanted to be seen as a contribution to their country. So it was also very interesting to see that a very different merit narrative could get inside uh, to change their behavior. And so we came back and to realize that if we had 
use the usual narrative of um, you know reduction uh, depletion of fish stocks in the future and how it will uh, you know be 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 dangerous to future generations it might have not been successful so we we develop another campaign where we use that sense of pride for fishermen for them to conduct more sustainable fishing behavior so what did i learn from both case studies so um from both it was very interesting to see and these are actually only some of the case studies that uh we work with where um the intervention that we initially assumed is not was turned out not to be um uh, uh, effective in the context that we are uh, we are trying to work in and so i realized that there was this gap between intervention designers and uh, the target audiences and when i say intervention designers here it's actually very broad so I, uh, it could be government it could be donors it could be environmental ngos or even corporations that are trying to achieve sustainable behavior change but there's sometimes still a gap. And so what can we do about this? Um, there's of course a lot of ways that we can avoid this, but one of the things that I've been very interested in and I mentioned it as very passionate in is that we create a safe space for sustainability change. And I know for some of you, sustainable uh, safe space is probably something very uh, common or you're very familiar with, but in a context from someone coming from a developing country, this is not something that uh, we talk about uh, very often. So how do we apply safe space? And this is based on the learnings that I have applied during the projects that I've worked in. So first of all, we have to be mindful of our own biases. And this means when we set out to create an intervention or design an intervention, we have to let go of all our attributes. And, uh, and, and this is sometimes not easy, but it will help for us to understand better our target audience. Second of all, we have to be mindful that sustainability issues are very complex. Like issues like climate change or waste management might be easy for you and me or many of the uh, viewers here at Nutstock, but it might not be in the context for the audience that I've just shown you before. So we need to allow time to create an environment to learn, reflect, and have open dialogues without judgment. And this is what uh, consists of creating a safe space. A third one, which I want to also highlight here is about facilitation. And I really believe that a well-designed facilitated process will improve understanding of our target audience. But sometimes a lot of sustainability practitioners or intervention designers don't take the time to invest in this facilitation process more. So I would really encourage us to think about our facilitation process and to think about how we can include safe space in there. The fourth one, and is something that we also learned from these case studies and many case studies that we found, is to avoid difficult jargons. I know it can be very tempting for people to include sustainability jargons in, um, in, in the work that they are doing for sustainability, but sometimes it can create that discrimination using words when we are trying to come in and trying to learn more about our audiences. And lastly, is, uh, and I think is the most important, is that we need to be open for more new, for new ways and creative ideas to change behavior. Um, and this might sometimes be hard um, if we already set on like one way of intervention, but we need to have that open mindset. And by creating a safe space, we allow that possibility that our intervention might not work and that we have to go um, in another way. So my last but not least, my, my, my key takeaway from this talk is that I think we need to be more mindful that there's still a gap between intervention designers and uh, the actual target audience. And um, with, it, with this talk, I hope that we can talk about safe space for sustainability more and try to adapt that into the work that we are doing. And this means no matter if you're a policymaker, if you're a scientist, if you work for environmental NGOs, if you're just an individual trying to make change in your community, let's discuss on how we can incorporate safe space uh, into our work. Thank you so much. 
Chinta, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, just a, uh, an interesting question. The way you define a safe space is effectively a part of the development process where anybody's free to say anything they like, propose anything they like, without fear of kind of sanction from seniors or that great problem that, look, we've already sunk, you know, two years of work into this programme. It all makes sense to everybody here in the room. Therefore, don't go and cause trouble by raising objections. It's in other words, it's a, it, it's a place where you can say things without fear of kind of rebuke or career damage. Is that right? So, yes, exactly, Rory. So, someone's just asked on Slido, um, what are your plans for the peatlands now, having seen that the original app approach um, didn't necessarily work and that some of the language was wrong and didn't chime with the, uh, with the audience? What, 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 are your, what, what are your next stage plans? Okay, um, thank you very much for the question. So, um, in the case of the peatland, uh, in the peatland case, from what I know, is the app has not been, it was not developed at the end. And as you know, that it would take a lot of uh, uh, um, investment if we want to develop an app. But what we learned from the field was there's actually different intervention strategies that you can use. Like, for example, using existing channels such as WhatsApp or even Facebook just to record or like just to report uh, situations over there. So sometimes I think we have the tendency to think a little bit too far <laughs> while the, uh, the, the elephant is actually just in front of your, in, the, uh, in your face. So like, um, yeah, so that's what I meant. There's a great book I'll recommend to you, which is bizarrely written by an anarchist anthropologist called, I think it's James C. Scott, <laughs> uh, and it's called Seeing Like a State. And he makes the point mm. that the state at the centre has a very, very bizarre, aggregated view of what real life on the ground is like and tends to make decisions based on a model of reality, not the complexity of lived experience. And funnily enough, I don't think it's a problem confined to the developing world either. Um, so I'll recommend mm. that book. Um, do, um, is there anything else you'd like to recommend in terms of... Because, uh, in a way, you've done something very valuable. You've killed something which made sense, but which probably <laughs> wouldn't have worked. What are your plans with the fisheries, for example? So, yeah, in the fisheries case, we are... Uh, so we actually develop another strategy, so a communication product. But we realise that this communication product cannot work alone as a product in itself. So we also develop uh, activation strategies around those communication products. And uh, what is really important to highlight here is that the key message is not the usual messages that you would hear in the scientific world. So like, you know, you need to take care of your fish catch and so on in order to reduce um, uh, fish stocks uh, and so on uh, uh, in the future conserve conservation messages, right? But what we did is we we developed together with our clients at that time, which was an environmental NGO, um, a narrative of a proud fisherman. You know, so so th th uh, it was called Nelayan Paduli, which is in Indonesian meaning a proud fisherman. So you're uh, you would be proud if you do this and this and this, and these are sustainable fishing behaviors, which um, which is very also important to achieve our a <laughs> better environment. <laughs> It's been a joy talking to you, not least because as well as anything else, in my earpiece, I get the sound of tropical bird life, which is the absolute joy. Oh, okay. um, so thank you for that as well. Um, I won't ask you to stay up until five o'clock in the morning, your time to see Damon Chantola speaking later, but do watch it uh, on catch up because he makes this exact same point. Um, actually, at the, fring you know, at the edges of society and lived life, people don't listen to the centre, they listen to each other. So do, do watch that, and I think you'll find it uh, immensely useful. So, Chinta, thank you very much indeed. And now I'm going to hand thank over... Thank you so much, Rory. ...back to the podium. Thank you. Ah!